Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's ULaw webinar. The topic for today's webinar is Trust and Gender Reconciliation Demystified. Today's webinar has been accredited for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. I welcome everyone who has joined us for today's webinar and kindly request you to use the chat window provided to ask any questions that you may have during the session. And since it's a CPD nature of this webinar, like every other ULaw webinar, today's webinar has this very specific agenda. The agenda is walking you through what a reconciliation process looks like in a legal firm's business, looking at the two major avenues or bank accounts within a legal firm, one around trust and general, and the differences between the trust and general reconciliation, the expectations from an auditor or a law society's bookkeeping compliance requirement in terms of what this reconciliation document looks like for both trust and general. A quick note on how best you can be proactive and be prepared for an audit in terms of a checklist. And last but not the least, we're going to walk you through the use of ULaw just as an example and through a live demonstration of what the reconciliation process looks like, what the reconciliation document looks like, and all of the Law Society's bookkeeping guideline documents that you can generate once you've had a very successful reconciliation for a particular term. Of course, before getting into the reconciliation process, we just spend a few minutes on the whole overall evolution, if you will, of the accounting system, right from the manual double entry system that we had way back, which was a very time-consuming process, especially when you had a large number of transactions and it did not allow for automation, and they were was more prone to a lot of arithmetic errors. And we've moved from a manual double entry system or period of time into a one write system, which is um, just a love for a certain level of automation, but it was still time consuming and error prone, to spreadsheet software, which is still very prominently used across legal firms which is, of course, inexpensive when you look at the overall cost of ownership of that particular product. It does facilitate certain level of automation, especially around calculations, so you can introduce formulas into the spreadsheet software. So for those who have joined us today who are using spreadsheet software to manage your ledgers and journals, of course, you can take advantage of the formulas in that spreadsheet software to help calculate, let's say, a total or a you know, summary things of that nature, but it's still a document that you as an individual will have to manage and maintain, make sure that you're manually entering the records as you invoice, as you transact with your bank account. And then evolving to the next level from a spreadsheet is your general accounting software. Does your automatic calculations, does allow you to post your ledgers, journals, and especially even sub-ledgers, and also produces documentation that you can present as part of your audit requirements. But once again, it was not purpose-built for a legal firm. It was not purpose-built to highlight, let's say, the specific needs of the bookkeeping guidelines, especially if your firm deals with trust money. Right. And... Uh, But then the evolution is now into the legal accounting software world, which was purpose-built for, I would say, the legal compliance of a legal firm's reconciliation process, right? It allows you to produce ledgers, journals, was purpose-built to manage trust accounting, plus your automatic calculations, allows you to post ledgers, sub-ledgers, 
and most definitely, yes, it does produce all the financial reports that you need. And till about 15 to 20 years back, maybe as even as recent as 10 years, many of these software were PC-based, were locally deployed in a machine. It was dependent now on the physical nature of that device or machine. A very good evolution of the legal accounting software that you as legal professionals are hopefully exploring today are the cloud-enabled legal accounting software that gives you, of course, all the benefits of a legal accounting software, reduces the expensive nature of the software previously, and also facilitates the anytime, anywhere you have internet to access this information, especially in this post-COVID world. So this is really what you have in your arsenal to explore in terms of tools and methodologies that can help the reconciliation process within your firm. Okay, So it really comes down to the nature of your business, the specific components of your business, your choice of a tool or a process that you have decided upon that you are currently proceeding with, as well as the nature of any new tools that you are exploring to purchase to help you through this journey and help you be proactive in being able to create, generate, and be top of these reconciliation documents. Okay? A legal firm, uh, especially in Canada, now has the opportunity to exercise the trust account, which is a very special account that's provided to you and it's available to you to exercise legally where you are able to accept money from your clients in advance prior to even starting the work. But because of that specific nature of how you're going to take that money in advance, there are, of course, boundaries, rules, and guidelines of how you earn that money. So initially, when you accept money into that retainer trust account, you have not yet earned that money into your business. So the ability you don't have the ability yet to move that trust money into your operating account because that's where your business now sees the revenue coming in. But prior to that, for you to be able to earn that money is where you as a business would have to reflect the amount of effort or any expenses or disbursements that you've incurred on behalf of a file for the client, reflect the amount of dollars, including disbursements and dockets, in an official document, which is now agreed upon as the invoice, which you then send to your client. And depending on how much of retainer you received and how much of effort and disbursements you've reflected in the invoice, you would then be able to move the eligible trust amount from the trust account into the general account. Right? So I'm just setting the context so you, once again we appreciate the need of exercising this trust. It helps you as the legal firm or a professional to help safeguard the amount of effort and time that you've put in in working for a client's file. Because if you don't have or do not use the trust account, then the other side of the business is where you intake the client, you do not take any retainer amount, you put in your effort, you dock it, you may even disperse and spend on behalf of your client, and then generate an invoice. And now, instead of doing a trust transfer, you are now awaiting for a client payment. Of course, your engagement letter is probably well drafted to a certain extent to cover you and your business in case that the client does not pay you. But in many cases, it's not only the amount of money that's not being paid. Many a times, it's the amount of time that a client may take to pay you back. And it's, of course, not worth it to go to court to fight that unless it's a much larger amount. And many a times, 
it's written off as a business loss. Now, to avoid this and to protect the legal practitioners, the Law Society, of course, has introduced this wonderful account type called as trust account, which hopefully allows you to benefit from and protect your firm from such non-payments. But in doing so, as I mentioned earlier, there are certain boundaries, guidelines that guide you through how best you can transact, make the money yours, but also reflect it through the reconciliation process to not only capture any mistakes or errors that may have occurred during your transaction, but also facilitates for you to be top of your numbers. So if there's a bank error, you have the opportunity through the reconciliation process to capture that error early enough so that you don't have the wrong expectations of the revenue expenses for your own firm, right? And part of that reconciliation process for your trust account, there is what's called as a reconciliation report that is expected by you as a legal firm at least once a month to be generated for that end of term. So typically, the expectation from the Law Society is that you have one reconciliation report, a minimum of a rec- one reconciliation report per month. So you have one report for Jan, going up till December, you have 12 reconciliation reports for every year. Of course, you can have four reconciliation documents within a month where you're reconciling every week. And that's even better as a practice and as a discipline because so now you're catching these numbers closer to your memory. So if something had occurred this previous week, by reconciling end of Friday, you pretty much know these numbers by heart because it's very recent compared to you having to dig your memory unless you've taken notes about what these transactions were beginning of the month or let's say beginning of November if you've not reconciled for a couple of months, right? So the closer you are able to reconcile, the better it is for you. The only caveat to that, of course, is if you're going to be doing, let's say, four reconciliations a month, that is one at the end of every week, then you need to manage those four documents and hence 48 different reports at the end of every year to showcase and tell the story around your reconciliation. Okay? Sometimes you could do it once every two weeks and reduce the number of documents, but the bottom line is that you are required to reconcile at least once a month and produce this report. And as you can see on the screen right here, there are specific requirements in terms of data that's being collected and information that the auditor or the law society is looking to capture through this report. And there are four important data sets that they request you as the legal firm to capture on this monthly reconciliation report. The first is, of course, capturing the bank statement and the balances. So the reconciliation process, and if you look at the, you know, the wiki definition of that, right? It really talks about the reconciliation process being the ability for you as a firm um, of ensuring that the, there are two sets of records that, and they are in agreement. The two sets of records that you as a firm have, one exists within your practice management legal accounting world whether it's a software, whether it's an Excel sheet, whether it's you writing down on a piece of paper, that is your own bookkeeping system that has one set of records of all the transactions that touch the trust. The other set, of course, is the financial institution that you're working with, whether it's a bank or a credit union, any financial institution that you work with, they hold the next set of records. So this reconciliation process is ensuring that these two sets of records are in agreement. And it is also to ensure that, of course, that the money leaving an account matches with the actual money spent or received. Right. So if you have received, for example, 
$1,000 of a retainer. And let's say you have told your own bookkeeping system because you got a $1,000 check right, from the client. So you, you've taken the leap of faith. You're saying, here's the check of $1,000. And hence, right away, you write it down on your piece of paper or you write out, type it into your legal accounting system that it's $1,000. And you're expecting the $1,000 to be in your trust account. But let us say in real life, when you deposit that into your bank, okay, and by a mistake, and that these mistakes happen all the time, and it's too real not to happen. And these mistakes happen where the bank, unless you have spoken to them about it previously or you have instructed them otherwise, the bank sometimes may take the bank fees, let's say transaction fees or bank fees, out of your trust account or may remove that from that $1,000 that you deposited. And, for example, deposit $992. So maybe they took a $8 transaction fee and they only deposited $992. Now, the reconciliation process at the end of a term allows you to compare these two sets of records. One, on one hand, you have a $1,000 record entry in your bookkeeping system because that's what you expected. But in reality there was only 992 that was reflected in the bank. Same day, maybe other days, but these two transactions that are supposed to be the same number are now different. So now you have the responsibility through this reconciliation report, report that this $8 was a bank error and that is the reason why you have this discrepancy between 1000 and the 992 and that's exactly what they capture as a bank error that occurred for $9 in this case it was 9 in our example it was 8 so we include any bank errors that may have occurred because that all adds up or subtracts to give you the bank balance like how you have two transactions and two set of records at the end of a term, you're going to have the balance in your trust, which is a summary or an addition of all the outstanding trust balances in that bank account. So your bookkeeping system is going to have a total. Your bank is going to have a total. And that's the first data set, which is really the bank balance. Then comes recording the data set around any outstanding checks and deposits and we discussed the bank errors so there is two to three different possibilities that are practical and very pragmatic in nature that may introduce these discrepancies between your set of bookkeeping and the bank's set of transactions we spoke about bank error the other two examples are very straightforward one is what we call as an outstanding deposit and the other one is called of course the outstanding checks so imagine you got the thousand dollars the same example and you've told your bookkeeping system that yes I've got thousand dollars towards this file now for some reason let's assume it was a Friday afternoon you were very quick to enter the thousand dollars as having received from this client maybe you had to give them a retainer receipt and hence you put it into your accounting system it's now captured in your side of the world but for whatever reason it slipped your mind and you just drop that check okay in your office or maybe in your wallet or your purse and you have now forgotten to deposit this bank or deposit this check rather in your financial institution. So as of that day, until the point where you actually deposit this check, there is going to be a discrepancy where your books are going to say $1,000, whereas that has not yet reflected in the bank. And once again, as, um, as naive as you may think that this is, many times these are the possibilities that result 
in discrepancies in illegal firms world and hence has facilitated a law society pushing for a document that allows you to record this. So this error and this situation has arised so much that's why they've even institutionalized this document to begin with. Now it's your responsibility at the time of reconciliation to say, oh my God, yes, there's that $1,000 in my wallet. I forgot to deposit it. And the sooner you can reconcile, if you've done this reconciliation at the end of this weekend, you probably know that the check is in the wallet and you can deposit it on Monday morning. And hence, when you come to the end of the month in December, when you do your overall reconciliation, you do not have to worry about how to adjust this discrepancy or carry that money over to the next month. Okay. Likewise, the other side of the house is you've got the $1,000. You've run to the financial institution to deposit it in. Maybe you forgot to write it in the Excel sheet or your accounting system that you got it. And hence what's going to happen when you reconcile is the bank is going to have $1,000 extra, whereas you have no record keeping of that $1,000. Okay, so that's an outstanding check. So either the bank is off or your own bookkeeping, record keeping is off, or there's a bank error that you did not account for. These are some simple examples that can lead to discrepancies between your set of record keeping and the financial institution's set of record keeping on behalf of your business. And the whole process of reconciliation is to come into a harmony for you to quickly, first of all, visualize this discrepancy or visualize these two sets of records, appreciate the discrepancies, if any, reflect the truth behind these discrepancies, and record it in this document and reflect it to the auditor when you're being asked for it. Okay, so the second set of data is around the discrepancies and the possible nature of these discrepancies, including outstanding checks, deposits, and any bank errors. Now, the third is a very important data set that the Law Society looks for in that reconciliation statement. So if you say, as of November 30th, 2020, that this is my trust reconciliation re report, the Law Society expects you to have line item by line item recording of the client's trust listing. And what that really means is the outstanding balances in your trust account, client by client, with the last activity date and the total amount left in the trust account by file client clearly recorded. So for example, if you have $5,000 as the bank balance in your trust account, the law society wants to understand, okay, how did that 5000 end up in that account as of November 30th? So who are all those individuals or clients or businesses that have deposited money in this trust account, almost as a deposit into a bank account? And how much of money did they provide you early on? How much of money have you taken out? And this amount is what's left. So let's say in that $5,000, a client gave you $2,000 as a retainer, and you worked and reflected in an invoice about $800 worth of effort, and you've moved that money of $800 from that bucket of $2,000 into your general account. So you've moved $800 from the trust into the general because of the effort and the invoice you've generated. Now, the balance left in that client's trust bucket is $1,200. Likewise, you may have another bucket of $800 for another client that's added up to $2,000, you may then have three more clients with each having an outstanding balance in their bucket 
$1,000. Now, these five clients and the outstanding balances in their trust bucket in that trust account is what has added up to give you that 5000 as a balance in the bank. And the law society needs you to record this. It can't be an approximation. It has to be a very clear cut math around the balances per client, especially with the last activity date. And the reason for that is let's say that you have not worked on a particular client's file for over five years. There are guidelines that the auditor would come to you and say, have you considered or have you already taken the steps to reach out to this client and show me proof that you've done that? To tell your client that there's this outstanding balance, do you want to move ahead with the work or not? Maybe you're stuck because you're expecting the client to move forward. There has to be a reason why you have that balance in that trust account for so for that long a time. And typically the recommendation is that if you are holding trust amount or trust dollars in your client's bucket for too long, the expectation and the best practice is for you to refund that retainer amount. So if you've had that $1,200 for seven years and you've not done that work and your last activity date was in 2013, for example, then it's about time for you to just write a check, send a completion closure letter or non-engagement letter that clearly states hereby attaching the refund of your retainer. Of course, the initial $800, the legal firm has earned the right because you've put the effort, and that's the reason why you have the last activity date as part of one of the columns in the third important data set within a trust reconciliation report. The fourth data set within a trust reconciliation report is just a summary, which is finally showing you a comparison between these two sets. So if you can notice here, it's 1715, and 1715 is the balance between what the financial institution says, which is your total reconciled trust bank balance. So that's the financial institution's truth. The total unexpended balances, unexpended, so these have not been spent yet, per your client's trust ledger, which is your own internal bookkeeping. That is 1715. And how did you have the 1715? It's through this. That's why it says C client trust listing above. This is how that 1715 came about. That was 1,120 from Peter Piper, $72 left from Susan, and another $523 from Terry. Okay? So these are the important four data sets in a reconciliation report. Whether you generate this yourself manually or whether you use a system to do this, you should be completely aware of these four data sets in this report. Okay? Now we move on to the gender reconciliation. Now, a legal firm, of course, may not sometimes have a trust account. It's, of course, by choice. It's a great vehicle to mitigate the risk of non-payment, but it's not a mandatory account that you have to exercise. It's a very nice to have, ideal to have, best practices to have account, but it's not mandatory. So many or some of the legal firms may not have a trust account, but all legal firms most would have, or a business would have an operating account, and hence you most certainly have what's called a, a general account. Okay, and as much as there is this underlying current that auditors and law society bookkeeping guidelines, of course, puts a lot of stress around trust reconciliation because of the nature of the business. This is money that you have taken in a leap of faith from this client, right? There's so the leap of faith that the customers have provided you this money is because of the profession, the leap of faith in your professional conduct 
as well as the leap of faith in the overall governance of the professionals. And hence, there's a lot more scrutiny around trust account because unfortunately, some of these funds have been misappropriated by not showing the right numbers. People have, you know, I think there's been a lot of malpractice, let's say, or not sticking to the guidelines provided of how you manage these funds. And hence, there's a lot of strictness in ensuring that the trust ledgers or reconciliations are in compliance. But that does not mean that there is not a need at all for general reconciliation or if they would not ask you for it. The general reconciliation is definitely a part of the Law Society's audit requirements. Depending on the auditor, depending on your books, right? they may actually ask you for it. If you don't have trust account at all, of course, then, you're then they're going to definitely ask you for the general reconciliation. And the reason I say this is because we've been doing this for a few years now at ULaw, and sometimes we find that clients are very strict about doing the trust reconciliation, maybe a bit lenient about doing their general reconciliation. And we want to stress the need and the best practice around doing both reconciliations as close as possible. So if you're doing every uh, trust reconciliation every month, just make it a habit to do the general reconciliation every month as well. Of course, you might end up having more transactions within a general account, especially if you only have one operating account for your business expenses as well as your client-related you know, ins and outs, revenue coming in, expenses going out. So it's going to be a little bit more muddled. Uh, and that's why you have the right tools to depend on and the right process strategies that you can deploy to make sure that you're staying on top of these numbers. So long story short, the gender reconciliation report is something, at least in 2021, we hope that you would take it as an important document and build it as part of your process, build it as part of your overall training manual for you and all other colleagues in your firm to be ready to generate. And there's one small difference between the general reconciliation and the trust reconciliation report. Step one, or the first data set, remains to be the same, which is recording the bank statement between the two data sets. What's the bank balance as per the financial institution, and what is the balance as per your bookkeeping? Okay, And what are the outstanding deposits, receipts, checks, as the second data set, you do not have the need for the trust listing here. Like how we had the third data set in the trust reconciliation report where we spoke about the client's trust listing, you do not have such a need that you know, requires you to pretty much outline how did you arrive at this total. So you don't need to report every money in coming out, going on, right? Thankfully, you don't have to do that, but you still need to account for the balance, the outstanding checks and deposits, and of course, the comparison between the financial institution's record set and your own internal ledgers or bookkeeping transactions. Okay, so that's the difference. Keep in mind, of course, in a general account or an operating account, this is where, whether it's trust transfers to move money from trust to general, you're going to again get deposits in. If you're paying disbursements out of this general account, then you're going to have withdrawals out of this account. If you're paying for office expenses out of this, if you're paying for your law society fees, if you're paying for the printer that you're purchasing, buying things online, a laptop on Amazon, all of that reflects in this general account if, you, of course, you're using this general account to pay for it. Okay, so the source of ins and outs is a little bit more complex or convoluted in an operating general account compared to the trust account. Okay. In terms of generating this reconciliation report, 
especially if you're using an accounting software, a legal accounting software, we believe you can pretty much boil it down to three important steps that you take. One is telling, before you generate this reconciliation report, the first step is essentially confirming the actual date of this reconciliation. So as of today is when you're going to be, or as of a certain day, is when you're going to say, I'm reconciling. So you're taking all the transactions from the beginning of time that you've not reconciled till today. And you're agreeing that through this document, you're capturing all the transactions till this particular date. So that's number one. The second important step that you should be prepared and ready to have as information is, of course, opening up your financial institutions online account if you have one or if you've got your monthly weekly bank statements depending on that date of reconciliation so let's say you're doing this for the end of November then of course opening up your bank statement for the end of November so let's agree upon November 30th being that date and then having the financial institutions balance as of November 30th. So though we're in December 11th today, you're now going back in time to capture all of those, which means that all transactions from December 1st till today are not going to be accounted for in that November reconciliation report. It's pretty straightforward. And that's the reason for the date of reconciliation, and that's the reason for the appropriate bank balance as of that date, because you should have the flexibility to backdate. And the third most important and maybe the most time-consuming component of this reconciliation procedure, let's call it, is comparing the two data sets. This is where you're visually looking at all the transactions that you have entered in your diary or your legal accounting system or your any system that you have a record with the financial institution's listing of transactions. So this is where you're going to see the difference between the $1,000 in your book and the 992 that's reflected in the bank. So when you see these two transactions and you see that the bank has 992, which is $8 less than the retainer amount, then you're going to quickly go into the bank account and see what the heck happened, call the bank, ask them why they did that, and then they're probably going to give you an explanation. And if you have raised this flag early enough, so let's say you reconciled on the 15th and this error happened on the 10th and you did it that weekend, you could have gone to the bank on the 16th and said, please make sure you put that $8 back into my trust account and remove any fees from my general account then when you reconcile at the end of November month, you don't even have to worry about it because you would have $1,000 showing up in your bookkeeping system and you would have two transactions in your bank, one for 992 and another one where the bank would have deposited $8. That would add up to equate to this $1,000 that you have on your site. And hence, as a total, resulting total, it would still balance and you have helped yourself of not having to report that as a bank error at the end of this term. So if you've caught it early enough, and that's one of the advantages of reconciling on a more regular basis, not even waiting till the end of the month. The advantage is that is you can capture bank errors and rectify it and it does not even have to reflect in a reconciliation report. If you've not done that, then of course you have to showcase that there was actually a bank error of $8. And that is why your financial system has $8 less compared to your own bookkeeping system. So the third step is looking at each and every transaction that you have recorded and making sure that there's proof that those transactions in some shape or form exist in the bank. And if they don't exist, validating 
through why they don't exist. And we looked at those three reasons, whether it's bank errors, outstanding deposits, or outstanding checks. And if they don't balance, you use those buckets to explain and validate as the reasoning behind the discrepancies between these two data sets. So I repeat as a summary the three important steps that you may consider as a part of your reconciliation procedure to generate the reconciliation report. One, determining the data reconciliation. Step two, determining the bank balance as of that data reconciliation. And step three is comparing line by item by line item the transactions that you recorded till that data reconciliation between the two data sets, one, your own bookkeeping, and the other is the financial institution's transactions. Okay? Hopefully, this is kind of helping you paint a picture. In fact, this is a very good time period to pretty much reconcile and make sure that you're entering the 2021 with a big bang, especially reconciling this month in December is very important and critical because you are now entering year end and you do have your year end report, which is an important report to submit to the Law Society and hence ensuring that even if you've not, let's say, done the last six, seven months of reconciliation, here's a golden opportunity for you to catch up for lost time through the month of December, reconciling it for the end of this year. Okay? Taking, and of course, this is a, a recorded session that's available to you to replay in our YouTube channel. And um, it would, of course, be labeled based on the topic, which is Trust and General Reconciliation Demystified with today's date on it. So if you haven't reconciled in a while, please make sure that you take the strength, the courage, and the knowledge to help yourself so that you're compliant and worry-free as you enter 2021. We have enough worries as it is. This should be the last of it. Now, let's paint a rosier picture around reconciliation. So let's stay away from the fear factor. The fear factor is the, you know, not knowing why there is a discrepancy because you've not caught it early enough. And that's definitely an issue. So you have to do a deeper dive. So the fear factor is almost around, will I remember? What if I don't remember? What if I don't have the record to show those transactions in the bank? And these are very practical, pragmatic fear factors. Uh, and that sometimes keeps you from sleeping. Sometimes it keeps you from opening up the bank account because you don't want to face the reality. And that's all fine. All we're saying is end this year by putting one weekend or two weekends to bite the bullet, drink extra coffee, get it done with, and have the courage, knowledge to start the new year and do this more often because then now you don't worry about it. You're not fearful of it. You're something that becomes like a second habit for you to do as part of you being a legal professional business owner. Just like how you go to court, it's fearful at first, but you have to do it as part of your job. This is something that you do have to unfortunately do it as part of owning this business. Whether you do it yourself or provide the information so that a third-party bookkeeper accountant does it for you, doesn't matter. Um, they will still come back to you to ask you for the information. And when you sign up that document with that bookkeeper accountant, they're clearly stating that you are still responsible for the prudence of the data that you've provided. The accountant bookkeeper is helping you manage the books. They're not, allowed, you know, they're not vouching for the prudence of the data. That's something that you are still doing. But the good side of things is if you have done your reconciliation, then you have caught up with those two major issues that you're always fearful of, right? Which is, why is my accounting system not matching with my financial records? 
because you've just done that. By catching it early, you know what the reasons are. Either you've not entered it into your accounting system because you deposit the check, you just did not tell us, which is easy PC, you can do that real quick. Or the bigger problem is it's in the accounting system, but for whatever reason, it's not yet in the bank. And that's when you have to scamper to search for that wallet or purse that carries that check. Other reasons where it may have reflected in your accounting system but has not yet reflected in the bank is where you may have written a check, maybe a refund of a retainer, right? And you've given that check to your client. and Maybe they forgot and lost that check. It happens all the time. So you write a refund to a client. And in your accounting system, it's been accounted for of having removed from your trust account. Because you've cleared the check. You've said, yeah, here's $800 back. But if that client has not taken that check and deposited it into his, his or her own bank, then that $800 is not going to be withdrawn from your trust account. Right? And hence, that's another reason for a discrepancy. But doing this reconciliation process allows you to, of course, catch all these possible errors that leads to that discrepancies. So you could catch it early, call that client and ask them, I'm sorry, what happened? Did you lose the check? Do you need me to reissue another check? So then in that case, you have to cancel the previous check, go to the bank, reissue a new refund, and uh, and then you're back to you know, square one, right? So beyond catching the issues, the more positive aspect of a reconciliation process is now you have the most important thing in terms of legal accounting, an up-to-date system. So as of November 30th, everything is squared up and every transaction between what you have recorded has a direct connection to an entry in your financial system, which sounds great, sounds more rounded. You feel confident no matter how the numbers look, you're very confident and you can stand behind those numbers. Second, most importantly, you already are audit ready. So if you are a new practitioner, of course, you, I'm sure you appreciate that within the first 12 to 18 months, you are going to be audited. If you've not ever been audited before, then the chances are that you will be audited in the coming months. So by ensuring that you're reconciling your bank statements on a monthly basis, you are audit ready from day one. Third, you are ready to file your taxes for CRA. By ensuring that you've actually compared the numbers in your general account, you have now validated the actual money in the bank as of a certain month. So as of November 30th, if you say that there's $3,000 in your bank account, in your general account, that's going to be directly taken into calculating your P&L. It's going to take direct calculations for your provincial taxes. And hence, now you're ready to file your taxes with the Canadian Revenue Agency, both from your HST, GST, PST, as well as your corporate income tax. Right? Because some firms do quarterly HST or GST, PST payments. Some of them do monthly. So, Reconciling at least once a month allows you to be ready for filing your taxes because the numbers are written in stone and you've validated it and you're behind it. Now, the last few set of advantages, of course, are around the accuracy of data that tells you, the business owner, the accuracy around the P&L. So if you have reconciled the month of November, you know 3,000 means 3,000. It's not 3,500, it's not 2,500, it's 3,000. You know it. That also clearly reflects in the accounting system's impact to your business. So if you're making business decisions or on how much of money you want to invest in marketing initiative, and that depends on the amount of expenses and revenue that you've generated month on month, having that firm number, that confident truth behind these numbers is going to love you to make those important business decisions. 
And of course, last but not the least, you have a peace of mind that you know what those numbers mean, why they exist, and the truth is the validation of those transactions. Okay? Of course, all of these sounds like I'm making this huge press statement or this inspirational speech for why we should reconcile. But it's the fact of the matter is that if you have reconciled, you certainly have a bit of peace of mind. Compared to, let's say, someone who's not reconciled for a few months, they're either hoping for a miracle or hoping for their bookkeeper accountant to do it or have to fear that one weekend that they have to drink a lot of coffee and put that effort to be up to date. Right? Now, once you have reconciled, another positivity that we want to share with you is you are audit ready. And the audit readiness is, does not end with just a reconciliation report. An auditor during an audit is going to ask you for ledgers and journals. These ledgers and journals are documents, different chapters of that overall accounting journey or book that you write for your auditor. And each chapter tells a different story. Right? So the trust ledger tells a certain story, has certain data components in it, whereas the trust journal has certain additional details, tells you a different story, a perspective of that same story. So a trust ledger tells you the date you received that retainer, who did you receive it from, how much was the amount, and what's the balance. Whereas the journal also adds one more item to it, which is how did they pay for it? What was the method of payment? So if you have to go back and scamper to find where is that discrepancy between what's in my bank as $1,000 and it's not available to me in my bookkeeping system, this is the best way to do it is to find out through your journal all the money that you've reflected as received and how you've received it. So it's important that you capture every time you receive a retainer how you've got it, especially if you're dealing with now cash. Then that, of course, adds to the complication. Long story short, once you're reconciled, you're now ready to generate these documents with confidence. Your ledgers and journals. Okay? All right, so typical checklist for your audit readiness, let's say. Oops. We've spoken enough about your reconciliation, added the general ledgers, trust ledgers, and journals, and any provincial documents that you need, like Form 9A in Ontario, etc. Some other things more generic in nature that you may want to keep in mind is around the Retainer documents, how for every file you have a clear structured retainer or an engagement letter. Ensuring that the fee structure is well clearly articulated and how you've docketed, dispersed, and transferred money from trust to general reflect what you've agreed upon in that retainer agreement. Okay, So if you agree that you only do monthly trust transfers or you only raise an invoice every month, and you then end up doing it as you please, then that would be something that is highlighted in an audit. Generating invoices. Often it's recommended that you raise invoices as and when it happens, unless you have otherwise bargained to do something different with your client. Managing your invoice balances. Now, this is very important. If you have generated an invoice, and this goes back to your accounts receivable, goes back to having a better P&L, goes back to your reconciliation. So if you've generated an invoice and the client has not paid you over 30 days, for example, and let's say that is your days of sale, then it's very important that you have the right documents, reports, that can give you a list of all the clients that who have not paid you, and now you need to follow up to get that payment. Or at some particular point in time, you do need to write it off if you've been holding all those accounts payables, or receivables rather. 
right? So the invoice balance report, uh, again, the technical lingo, of course, or your accounts receivable gives you um, all the outstanding payments. And last but not the least, of course, having the right procedures to manage and handle the trust accounts, ensuring right from having the right trust you know, account with the financial institutions, maintaining ledgers, journals, keeping copy of all of your trust receipts and disbursements, ensuring that you've got Form 9As documented every time you do an electronic transfer, especially if you're in the province of Ontario. And if you have signed up for your HST, GST, PST, ensuring that you are capturing both the received component of the HST and the paid component of that HST. So you've received HST or you know, provincial taxes from your client through invoices, and then you capture all of the HST, GST that you've paid as part of, let's say, an office expense. And you equate these two, and that's the difference of that is what you either owe the government or the government owes you. All of that goes into that checklist. Okay, so with another five minutes left in our webinar, I want to be very mindful and respectful of your time. I'm going to show you how legal accounting software allows you to facilitate this, do it faster, easier, um, and removes a little bit of the mystery behind it. For more information, please do Google um, either your provincial, uh, if you're joining from other provinces. Um, each province has wonderfully well-written, documented guidelines around audits, bookkeeping guidelines. Um, you can replace LSUC with LSO, and you have the documentation available. You can just say spot audit, audit checklist, and bookkeeping guidelines, and then mention your province's name. And uh, you can, or the law society's name, and you should be able to gather that. Okay, so if, if there are any more questions regarding the presentation, please feel free to chat and tell us what your questions are. And I'm going to try and run through this real quick. So, assuming that you've got, let's say, a retainer in this matter, I'm going to add a retainer. And let's put a fancy number of $5,000. Came through a check. Let's put our fancy number here too. One, two, three, six, six, six. Giving a trust receipt and applying. And you can see in this matter, the client already owes this matter $226. And hence, with this 5000 coming in, you're going to do the math of 5,000 minus the 226, so 4,774 is the balance left, or potential balance left. Let me go ahead and do a quick trust transfer as well. Now if I go into my reconciliation process, you're going to see that $5,000 being recorded. Of course, there was a previous 2500 from a previous different client. Okay? So you can right away see this is how a system is helping you keep a track of each and every transaction as in when you enter it. And if I go into my general reconciliation, of course, you're going to see a lot of transactions starting from October to today, but you don't see any transaction for today's date yet. Okay? So no transactions has yet touched the reconciliation, general reconciliation. Now let's say I do a docket And let me go ahead and add a docket. I'll say final closure. Okay. 
put a flat rate of $4,000. Okay, so it's going to calculate the 4000 Let's go ahead and finally invoice this client as well. So the invoicing, of course, is the step that we spoke about that allows you to officially validate how much of money that you are conveying to your client as the eligible trust amount that you are now going to move from the advance that the client had paid you into their own operating account. Right? So if the client provided $5,000, you've just said, through this one docket, I'm charging you 4000 Of course, you want to make sure you validate through descriptions of the work that you've done. So I'm skipping that today for the purposes of the demo. Now if I go in and do my reconciliation, or in fact, let me just do one last step. Let me do the, t the trust transfer. So it reflects in the general account. So let me do that transfer of 4,000. So all I'm trying to showcase to you is that you are capturing transactions into your own record keeping as and when these transactions occur. And here's a Form 9A that you can download as well. Right? And as you do that, legal accounting software such as ULaw allows you to now automatically capture the trust and general reconciliation. So if I now go back to my trust reconciliation, now you see three transactions. So that was the 5000 we received, but you just did a trust transfer of 4746 Now all you do is you open up your bank statement. Let's say we're reconciling for the end of today, so the 11th of December. You just go ahead and say, let me open up my TD or whoever I bank with, put in the bank balance. Any bank errors, if any. And then you're going to check each of these transactions. Now let's say this date was not the 25th. Maybe it was the 27th, as per the bank. You can change that. Okay. Agree to all the dates that these transactions exist between your bookkeeping and the bank. And just generate the reconciliation document. It's as simple as that. It becomes overwhelming when you have more than, let's say, 20, 30 transactions at a time. And that's why you want to capture this as early as you can. The same thing goes for general. If I go into my general reconciliation, now you should see an added transaction, which is the 4,000. Let me just do a bank date. And here is the 4,746 that we received today. Okay, so you go ahead and we'll do the same capturing. And this is why I say there's about 26 different records that you have to do. Because you've not reconciled, or at least this account has not reconciled a few transactions even in October. So the more you leave it till the end, the more you have to deal with. Just like anything else, right? So let me go through each and every transaction compared with the bank. And this is where if there's an error, you got to go back and correct it. And put the bank balance here. And generate the gender reconciliation. And let me open up the trust reconciliation document. And you can see the four data sets the bank balance as of the date of 11th of December, all the cleared transactions in that time period, 
including the 5,000 that we received, which we confirmed exist, the trust transfer that exists, and we've confirmed that we received the retainer of 2,500 from Matthew. And here is most important, the client's trust listing. How did you end up with this phenomenal $476,000 721 balance in your trust account. That's a lot of money. Of course, this is a fake account, so this is how it all added up. You have close to, starting with, I think, Skywalker or Toby McGuire, who had 789 in balance. And the last activity date was back in 2016. That's a lot of time. And to the more recent ones, if you look at our Matthew, you can see he's got $2,500 in his bank balance thanks to that retainer that he paid us on 25th. And the fourth data set is the comparison between the financial institutions bank and the unexpended balances in your bookkeeping system. So, likewise, you have the general reconciliation, right, where you have the comparison between the two banks You have all the reconciled clear transactions. You do not see a trust listing need or a requirement here. You go straight into the third data set, which is the comparison between the two bank statements. Okay? So with that, I will conclude today's webinar. Uh, in fact, it's going to be probably one of our last webinars for this year. You do have on our YouTube channel as many CPDs that we've conducted from the 1st of January to date that we encourage you to review, and you are able to capture those CPD hours as well. Um, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. We look forward to uh, seeing you hopefully in the new year in our next webinar series, and uh, have yourself a wonderful year ahead and let the 2021 be a great year for all of us. So thank you. And if there are any questions regarding my webinar today or any other questions, please feel free to email us at support at ulawpractice.com. Okay? So thank you once again and have yourself a great weekend ahead.